Khabib Nurmagomedov, one of the world's most famous Muslims. Proud of his Dagestani heritage, he is also seen representing Russia. So how did Dagestan come under Russian rule? Well, pretty much the same way that Georgia, Azerbaijan and Armenia did. The subject matter that we're going to cover in this video sheds light onto a period of Persian history that was a far cry from the prestigious heights of its past glory. But the same can be said about the Islamic world in general, because this was a period that brought an aggressive and energized Europe hell-bent on acquiring resources from every corner of the world against Muslim states that had fallen behind in the race for technological progress. For millennia, the Southern Caucasus or Transcaucasia had been considered a traditional domain of influence for Persian empires. From the Achaemenids to the Sasanians to the Safavids, situated at a vital nexus point between Asia and Europe, the various ethnicities inhabiting the region had endured innumerable wars being fought on their territory throughout the passage of time. For Persian empires, the Caucasus Mountains, which gives the region its name, had proved to be a strong bulwark of defence from invaders from the north. But from the beginning of the 18th century, a power had emerged north of the Caucasus that was starting to flex its imperial muscles in all directions. The Russian Empire, started by Peter the Great in 1721, had its own eyes set on the mountainous region. For more on the Russian perspective, we go over to Canubis. Before the 19th century, and even after it to be honest, Russia has had a pretty traumatic history filled with invasions from all directions. Thus, it's not too hard to imagine why they were invaded so much. The traditional homeland of the Russian state around Moscow is located on the northern European plain. This means that if a state in Europe wanted to expand eastward into Russia, they would not have a major topographical unit, like a mountain range, to obstruct them. Similarly, in the east, the Russians only completed the extension of their territory to the Ural Mountains at the end of the 16th century. If you want to learn more about Russia's expansion throughout the centuries, head over to my channel Canubis after this video is done. Thanks for that Canubis. I'll leave a link to his video in the bio for you to watch after you're done with this video. Back to the Russian Empire. Now before you judge the Russians to be over the top paranoid about their geography, Need I remind you about Napoleon's invasion of Russia, or Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, or even way back when the Mongols showed up and did what they were famous for doing, destroying cities. So understandably, Russian leaders were aware of the need for better natural borders. From their perspective, having the Caucasus Mountains as their natural buffer with Persia and the Ottoman Empire would have made perfect sense to Russian policy makers in the 19th century. All the while in Persia, the 18th century was a period of great upheaval. It had gone from the declining power of the Safavids to being invaded by the Afghans and then having its fortunes briefly restored under Nadir Shah Afshar who died quickly after, thereby plunging Persia into anarchy once again. And this was all in the first half of the century. Much of the second half of the 18th century was influenced by this man, Karim Khan Zand who was able to control much of Persia, but not all of it. That task would be left to Agha Muhammad Khan, the founder of the Qajar dynasty. At the same time, the Russian Empire was slowly edging its way closer to the Caucasus Mountains. They had established their North Caucasus Line, a series of Russian forts and settlements to the immediate north of the mountain range. But with the Persians seemingly in disarray, there was no reason for the Russians to not go beyond the Caucasus especially if they could take advantage of trade routes. We have to remember that Iran was a vital piece of the legendary Silk Road. It just so happened that it wasn't just the Russians who wanted to take advantage of Persian weakness. The ambitious Heraclius II, the king of eastern Georgia, had used the turbulence to attain de facto autonomy for his state. He aimed to modernize his country but knew that he needed protection from a major power. So, he decided to turn his back on the Muslim Persians that had been the overlords of the area for centuries and look to his fellow Orthodox Christians in Russia for aid. The Russians, during the monarchy of Catherine the Great, were more than willing to oblige. 
and so the two sides penned the Treaty of Georgievesk in 1783 by which Russia now became the suzerain of Georgia rather than Persia. Now, by the middle of the 1790s, the Persians had gotten their act together. Forcefully reunited by the ruthless Agha Muhammad Khan, the first of the Qajar Shahs, Persia sought to regain its suzerainty over the Georgians. So in 1795, Agha Muhammad Khan invaded eastern Georgia, sacked the capital at Tbilisi and massacred thousands of Georgians. It should be noted that the Georgians explicitly asked the Russians for help, but there was none. The following year, Catherine the Great launched a war against the Persians, probably to save face, but that would be cut short by her death later that year. The next year, in 1797, the Qajar Shah Agha Muhammad Khan was assassinated as he was preparing for his second invasion of Georgia. By the end of 1800, the Russians had decided to annex eastern Georgia as part of their empire. Both the Ottomans and the Qajar Persians now had reasonable grounds to fear further Russian aggression in the Caucasus. The Russians wasted no time in expanding their influence in the area. By 1804, all the other Georgian kingdoms were now subdued under Russian rule. The new Persian Shah, Fath Ali Shah, was committed to reasserting Persian authority over the Georgians, just like his assassinated uncle. With the new Russian Tsar Alexander I in an especially expansionist mood in the Caucasus, Fat Ali Shah had very little choice but to confront him. The Persians had watched the Tsar's forces take Georgia bit by bit and were unable to do anything about it. But when the Russians besieged and subsequently took the city of Ganja in January 1804, there was an outcry in the Qajar royal court. Ganja in Azerbaijan was too close to Persian territory for the Shah to not react. The Qajar royal family came from the Qajar Turkic tribe, who were traditionally settled around Armenia, northern Persia and Azerbaijan, with Ganja being a key centre for their fellow tribesmen. So Fat Ali Shah dispatched his forces to the besieged city, only to arrive too late, slowed down by the bitter winter weather. The successful Russian siege was followed by a massacre of Ganja's inhabitants. No doubt this would have fueled the Persian desire for revenge as they had seen their fellow Shia Muslim brethren slaughtered. Afterwards, the city's name was changed to Elizabeth Pol in honour of the Tsar's wife, further demonstrating that this was a war for conquest and not just influence. At the start of the war, the Russian forces were led by Pavel Sitsyanov, an ethnic Georgian who was a keen advocate for Russian imperialism. On the Persian side, they were led by Abbas Mirza, the Qajar crown prince, now as you can see, at the start of the war, Abbas Mirza would have been 14 or 15 years old, which means it would have been hugely unlikely if he was leading his men into battle or even devising the strategies for war, so he must have had other Qajar military advisors to help him. Straight after taking Ganja, General Sitsyanov wanted to keep the momentum rolling and moved further west into Armenia. In June 1804, he moved his forces specifically in the direction of the key city of Yerevan, controlled by Qajar-backed forces. Both the Crown Prince and the Shah, Fat Ali Shah, were present at the siege of Yerevan. For nearly three months, the Russians unsuccessfully besieged the city. Their artillery caused a lot of damage, but the Persian forces were too much for them. Whilst the garrison inside the city stubbornly resisted the siege, Persian cavalrymen cut off supply routes for the Russians by surrounding them. This brings me on nicely to a common theme that ran throughout this war, which was the disparity in the size of the forces of the two powers. The Qajar Persians vastly outnumbered the Russians. This was because the Russians were engaged in numerous conflicts simultaneously, most notably with the Ottomans and of course the French. We should remember that this Russo-Persian war coincided with the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. In fact, Napoleon briefly recruited the Qajar Shah to his cause which saw the two sides draw up an alliance from 1807 until 1809. The French Emperor promised to return lands lost in the Caucasus to Russia in return for Persia maintaining an extra front against the Russians, who Napoleon was at war with at the time. Napoleon was also interested in the possibility of attacking British India through Persia as well. But whilst the Russians were lacking in manpower, 
they had a definitive advantage in terms of technology and military training. Since the time of Peter the Great, Russia had become obsessed with competing with the other European powers and tried to achieve this through modernization. The Persian forces were still organized along outdated military conventions, such as relying heavily on irregular cavalry. In the face of a disciplined and professional standing army, their chances were bleak. The Qajar crown prince Abbas Mirza was aware of the need for military progress and even tried to enlist his French allies to aid in the creation of his Nizami Jadid's forces. This change was certainly influenced by the reforms of the Ottoman Sultan Selim III who in the years before had introduced his own Nizami Jadid. Now if the Persians were happy they had a powerful friend like Napoleonic France on their side, they were going to be reminded of the harshness of international politics in a little bit. Because you see, in 1807, Napoleon made nice with the Russian Tsar, Alexander I, and signed the Treaty of Telsit, thus making the Franco-Persian alliance essentially null and void. On the battlefield, even though the reformist measures of Abbas Mirza were steps in the right direction, it was not practical to assume that they'd be perfectly absorbed and assimilated within a few years. This was a process that had taken the Europeans decades, perhaps even centuries. The disparity in military technology was on full display when Napoleon reneged on his previous agreement with the Russians and attacked them, even occupying Moscow at one point. But even with all that adversity, the Russian Tsar did not recall his troops from the Persian front. 1812 proved to be the pivotal year in the war. Just as Napoleon was discovering the stubborn persistence of the Russians, Abbas Mirza's Qajar forces were stunned by the intrepidness of his opponents. The Russians crossed the Aras River and hit the Persians with a surprise attack in October at Aslanduz, where Abbas Mirza had stationed his army. The Persians had no chance, many of them still asleep, thousands of them perished. The Russians had now broken the back of the Persian resistance. The final and decisive engagement of the war was the Russian siege of Lankaran in January 1813. Once the Russians had stormed the citadel, they did not leave any prisoners behind. No mercy was shown to the Persian garrison, which was given no quarter. Everyone was massacred inside. Such an emphatic victory meant that the Persians could not sue for peace on level terms peace was going to be imposed upon them. Under the auspices of the British, the Treaty of Gulistan was signed in October 1813 between the Persians and the Russians. The treaty confirmed Russia's territorial acquisitions of Dagestan, Georgia, much of Azerbaijan and parts of northern Armenia. In addition to this, Persia lost the right to navigate the Caspian Sea and only Russia could station its navy there. It should be made clear these losses were major blows to the territorial integrity of Persia. It would only be a matter of time before the Persians tried to do something about the losses. So in the summer of 1826, the Qajar Shah Fat Ali Shah, buoyed by his heir apparent Abbas Mirza and the British to regain lost territories, the Persians waged war on Imperial Russia once again. In the interlude between the two wars, the Russian Viceroy of the Caucasus had been kept busy mainly in Dagestan and Chechnya by troublemaking locals. With this in mind, it shouldn't surprise us too much to know that many local tribal chieftains gladly joined Abbas Mirza's forces to fight the Russian presence in the area. The War of 1826-28 started very promisingly for the Persians. They regained Baku, Lankaran and even Ganja over the summer of 1826. The Crown Prince Abbas Mirza's military reforms seemed to have been working. That was already demonstrated a few years before when the Qajars went to war with their Ottoman rivals in 1821. There Abbas Mirza's men had inflicted a heavy defeat on the Ottomans despite being outnumbered. But the honeymoon period did not last very long. By September, Russian reinforcements had arrived and after a brief battle they were able to regain control of the vital city of Ganja. Over the course of the next year, both sides fought inconclusive battles. That was until the Russians, at the end of September 1827, showed up before the walls of Yerevan, 
the key Armenian city which the Persians had so stubbornly fought to defend in the previous war with the Russians. After about a week, the city fell to Russian forces. The Persians retreated further into Iranian territory. By mid-October, the Russians were within touching distance of Tabriz, one of the most important cities in all of Persia. Soon after, Tabriz was taken without any opposition, followed by Uriya and Ardabil. The game was over. In February 1828, the Treaty of Turkmenchai was signed. Once again, the Persians had no choice but to sign it. The Russian general threatened to march on Tehran otherwise. Like the Treaty of Gulistan in 1813, Turkmenchai added to the misery imposed upon the Persians. They had to pay reparations of 20 million silver rubles and they had to accept that they had lost what was left of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Russia's ambitions in the Caucasus did not stop with this war. The very next month, it was at war with the Ottoman Empire. Whilst for Iranians, these two treaties of Gulistan and Turkmenchai are moments of national lows in their history. As for the variety of ethnicities living in the area, their struggle was not over. For some, like the Dagestanis and the Chechnyans, it was just beginning. It's in the next chapter of their history that we see famed figures of resistance such as Imam Shamil. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to check out Kanubis' video on how Russia got so big in the first place. I've linked that in the bio. Also in the bio, I've put the links to a newsletter that I do for free and my Patreon where you can contribute financially to Hikmah history. Until next time, peace.